All right, welcome everybody to the second part of this morning session. I will wait one more minute to allow people to rejoin. Um, uh, we will have two experimental talks um, and also well, this, uh, the discussion break, um, uh, or not break, but the discussion session in the middle. Um, all right, so let me start the session now. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, David Hume. He's a uh, work at NIS uh, on the, in the ion storage group, and he's going to tell us about quantum metrology and tests of fundamental physics with trap ions. Dave, thank you very much for speaking today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ana Maria. Uh, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, I, I really appreciate the format of this uh, workshop where you've given a whole lot of time for uh, discussion. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, more of that uh, today and in the next couple of days. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about really follows along real well with what we just heard from uh, Mariana, uh, which is uh, optical clock measurements for testing fundamental physics. Um, she did a great introduction to the kinds of fundamental physics and experimental systems that uh, we work with, uh, so I won't uh, have to spend as much time on uh, a lot of that, but I'll focus in on some of the experimental techniques that we use with uh, trapped ions in particular, um, and uh, hopefully give you an idea of the uh, state of, of the field and, and where we're going in the coming years. Um, so here's an outline. I want to just give an introduction to precision measurements with uh, trapped ions. Here I'm really talking about um, clock type measurements and the kinds of tests of fundamental physics that have been done uh, recently with those uh, systems. And then I want to spend some time um, discussing, you know, how we're, ex we're, we're trying to extend the reach of these trapped ion measurements. Uh, both in terms of the kinds of atomic systems that are accessible for these measurements, uh, as well as the uh, stability and the accuracy that we're able to achieve with them. Uh, so I'll talk about some recent uh, work um, related to both quantum logic spectroscopy, which is a key technique uh, for enabling measurements on uh, otherwise inaccessible systems, and the work that we've done to improve uh, measurement stability. So I'll start out just giving you an introduction. You know, this idea goes back many years now to sort of the vision of Hans Daymelt. And as he described it um, for uh, trapped ion systems, it's a single atomic par particle forever floating at rest in free space. And if you, you know, go back to those papers, he would actually turn that into an acronym, which is barely pronounceable. Um, but it's a really nice, um, I, you know, ideal. Uh, that we continue to work with. And what it's pointing to is uh, several things. One of them is quantum limited experiments. So we're really working uh, with a single or individual uh, trapped particles. Uh, forever floating, we can achieve very long interaction times. In fact, in some cases, a single ion, the self-same ion, can be stored for months at a time. Um, we can use laser cooling to bring these ions all the way to the ground state of motion, which in the context of optical clocks means very small relativistic shifts, uh, which is important for systematic uncertainty. Um, in free space, um, that's an idealization, but it uh, points to the fact that uh, we have really good control of the environment, uh, so we can achieve very small perturbations from uh, electromagnetic fields. Uh, so, you know, this is a really nice vision, and we've been working towards this for a long time. And I'll just say, um, a long time ago, this is uh, uh, going back to the 1980s, the resolution that uh, Daymelt predicted for these kinds of clocks was at the level of 10 to the minus 18. And, you know, just in recent years, we've been able to achieve uh, that level of uh, systematic uncertainty and that level of measurement uncertainty uh, as well. Uh, more recently, there have been, of course, a whole lot of developments in, uh, you know, developing the toolkit that enables us to do this. But one thing I want to point out in particular 
Um, the ideas coming from Dave Wineland um, and his work over uh, many years in the ion storage group, we can now also implement very strong and controllable interactions between ions. And that allows for some of the experiments I'll describe. It allows for uh, generating entangled states between ions. So it's just a really interesting addition uh, to this toolbox that's become uh, very important. Um, so uh, Mariana has already shown a really similar slide to this, so I can kind of skip over it. But the basic idea is that we're locking a laser to an internal um, resonance in an atom, you know, here it's shown as an S to P transition, uh, where it's the electron that serves as your very stable oscillator uh, in the atomic system. Um, and we have some tools that allow us to uh, first lock the laser to the atom and then count the uh, laser frequency, which in our case is all the way up at about a petahertz, so 10 to the 15 hertz. And that needs to be divided down without losing any uh, of the precision, uh, which is done using a femtosecond uh, laser comb, something that um, was uh, invented through the work of Ted Hanch and Jan Hall and was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2005. So there's been a lot of um, interesting um, tools that have been developed that, that, that make this possible. Um, we characterize the performance of clocks generally using two um, performance characteristics. One of them is the accuracy. That's the offset frequency of the clock uh, from its ideal unperturbed uh, resonance frequency. And the other is the stability. So that has to do with the statistical fluctuations in the um, clock frequency as measured. So this accuracy, it has to do with things like field shifts. If you have a magnetic field, it can shift the uh, frequency of um, the, the clock and lead to a systematic effect. So we spend a lot of time characterizing that kind of thing and trying to uh, control it and minimize it as much as possible. Um, and then the stability, um, in general, we think about the projection noise limit, which has to do with the number of uh, atoms that you have in uh, the clock. And that just leads to a fundamental limit in uh, the uh, noise that you get when you make measurements on the clock state. It enters into the stability here as the signal to noise ratio. So it's uh, better with uh, higher numbers of atoms. And there are quantum tricks that we can play, uh, which I won't be talking much about in, in this talk, but it's an you know, really interesting uh, avenue of research that uh, has been pursued by a lot of groups. In general, for the uh, measurements that I'm going to be describing in this talk, um, at least on the ion side, we have a single uh, ion. So the signal to noise ratio there is just one. Um, there, like, like I've said, there have been a whole lot of developments in this field uh, over the years. I want to summarize uh, that here. We've already seen a plot like this, but optical clocks um, have now overtaken their microwave uh, predecessors in terms of both accuracy and uh, stability. So we have 100 times more um, accurate clocks now based on optical transitions than the standard for time uh, in the world, which is the cesium um, hyperfine uh, resonance. Um, they've also, for many years now, approached quantum limits in uh, precision. So that's opened up opportunities for using um, new quantum techniques for um, enhancing that precision. These measurements have now been applied to a vast array of atomic species. I'll sp spend some time uh, talking about this. Um, I put up the periodic table. It gives you an idea of the kind of breadth of um, possibilities that there are out there. But I have to add that there are also, we're beginning to do measurements like this on molecular systems, which are much more um, complicated uh, level structures, but some of the techniques that we've developed can now be applied there. Um, and in, in addition to things like you know, more exo exotic systems like highly charged ions. So you imagine you know, taking off many electrons from any um, of these atoms on the periodic table there's just a, a huge range of possibilities and interesting measurements that can be done uh, with all of these 
um, atom, you know, atomic and ionic si uh, systems accessible. Um, these measurements are starting to extend across continental distances, notably in Europe, they've built a big network uh, connecting uh, metrology institutes and other institutions uh, with ultra stable uh, optical fiber links. So it's starting to, the, you know, the size of the networks are starting to spread. And as we've discussed already, we're thinking about ways to make this bigger and even going to um, satellite based systems. And finally, the subject of you know, this workshop is that these measurements have found numerous new applications in uh, fundamental and applied uh, physics, as evidenced by uh, this review paper from uh, Mariana and company from a few years ago. Uh, so there's just a whole lot going on, and hopefully I'll touch on some of that here. So I want to start to you know, mention some of the tests of fundamental physics that have already been done. Uh, using these clocks. The basic tool that we have is we can look for uh, space-time variation in the clock frequencies. So we're comparing the resonance frequency in one atom to the resonance frequency in another atom using this uh, femtosecond comb. We're measuring a ratio which is not limited in its um, accuracy to the um, accuracy of the primary standards. Um, and you can ask the question, well, what might cause these clock frequencies to vary? Uh, one thing is if the fundamental constants are not truly constant, then uh, you can see a drift uh, in these ratios. Uh, in particular, the fine structure constant sets the scale for um, the energy level differences in, in atoms. And you can search for drift in the fine structure constant uh, using atomic clock measurements. Uh, violations of relativity uh, theory. So if you have two clocks in different uh, reference frames, you can test the prediction of uh, relativity and um, look for um, uh, look for deviations from uh, those predi predictions to test some of these fundamental principles like local position invariance or Lorentz invariance. Um, and lastly, coupling to exotic particles or fields. Uh, this is something that Mariana has already talked quite a bit about, and I'll uh, mention a little bit more about. But clocks are really well suited for looking for these ultralight uh, dark matter candidates uh, with masses in this range uh, well below uh, an EV, uh, where they could lead to slow oscillations in the clock frequency. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, this has been quite a while, but uh, quite a while ago, but we made a measurement over the course of about a year between the aluminum ion optical clock and the mercury ion optical clock at NIST. And uh, we saw that that ratio stayed constant uh, to the level of um, about eight times 10 to the minus 17. That's the one sigma uncertainty uh, there over the course of a year. And by taking into account the sensitivity of these two resonance frequencies to a change in the fine structure constant, we could use that to put a really stringent bound on the linear drift in the fine structure constant alpha, which is at the level of about two parts in 10 to the 17 uh, per year. So we've done um, very recently some more measurements of all of the um, optical clocks at NIST and comparing them to JILA. So this was a big effort involving a bunch of different groups. Um, the you know, ion storage group, we have the aluminum ion clock. There's the group of Andrew Ludlow at NIST that has the ytterbium lattice clock and the group of Jun Yi uh, at JILA that has uh, strontium uh, optical lattice clocks. Um, so three uh, clock groups working together in conjunction with um, groups that are focused on uh, making stable uh, optical links between these institutions. So we had the group of Nate Newberry who um, constructed for this measurement a free space optical link connecting between the um, one of the towers on CU's campus to the uh, penthouse over at NIST. Um, and then the comb groups. So. Um, Scott Didams and um, Tara Fortier uh, leading the measurement groups that just you know make these really uh, precise measurements possible. So it's a lot of people working together together to make this happen. Um, 
This is kind of typical data from a day of measurement where uh, we've characterized the stability of these measurements um, for the three possible ratios. So we have ytterbium, strontium, and aluminum, all three possible ratios between them, um, starting uh, at, for the aluminum uh, clocks, about one times 10 to the minus 15 stability at one second, averaging down as one over root tau. And then for the lattice clocks with higher uh, stability, um, averaging down uh, faster all the way into the uh, range of uh, 10 to the minus 18 in less than a day. Um, and one thing to note here is that all of the instabilities associated with the network, so these fiber optic links, the free space links, the comb measurements are all well below the instabilities of the clocks themselves. Uh, so the, uh, the precision of uh, these measurements is really given by the clocks. We made measurements like this over the course of several uh, days. In fact, starting in um, uh, November of, let's see, this was 2017 and extending through June of 2018, made a bunch of measurements that are uh, really consistent over that time. And the main output of this, or one of the primary outputs of this, are three numbers that are now the best known constants of nature uh, of you know these uh, optical clock frequencies. We can write them down to 18 digits. And the uncertainties here correspond to total uncertainty from both um, systematic and um, statistical effects uh, that are in the mid uh, 10 to the minus 18 range. Um, so that's something that was just published this year. And it's a really nice thing that we can use that exact same data um, to look for possible um, signatures of ultralight dark matter. So this is something I don't need to spend too much time on because Mariana has already uh, discuss this, but the basic idea is that we take that data um, over time and we search for oscillations in the frequency ratio that would show up at the Compton frequency uh, corresponding to the mass of the dark matter particle. And for the clock measurements, those frequencies tend to be in the you know, 10 to the minus 22 EV up to 10 to the minus uh, 17 or so EV. Um, the amplitude of that signal depends on the dark matter density, which is known um, in the cold dark matter model. The coupling constant that it has, which would appear as an, uh, you know, a, an apparent um, oscillation in the fine structure constant in this case. Um, and there's an atom dependent sensitivity that comes in there. And um, that's something, yeah, I wanted that to pop up. Um, that's something that's really important for making these measurements and uh, it varies from atom to atom. So among all the measurements that I've discussed so far, the mercury ion has the most sens uh, sensitive transition because of relativistic effects in its structure. Um, it's about 10 times more sensitive than the next most sensitive, which is the ytterbium lattice clock. And you know, despite that um, much greater sensitivity the improvements that we've made in measurement stability uh, over the last 10 years have meant that they provide competitive constraints on this dark matter coupling constant over a range of masses. And you know, here I'm showing an exclusion plot uh, for previous uh, measurements that have been directed at this, including measurements um, on atomic dysprosium in uh, Dima Bootker's group and measurements between two microwave clocks at the CIRT uh, group, and then uh, atom cavity measurements that June is going to discuss more in the next talk. Um, but all of these together uh, combine to make um, close to an order of magnitude improvement over those previous measurements over several orders of magnitude in mass. Um, so that was uh, published just recently with those uh, ratio measurements. Um, so that's, you know, a couple of examples of the kinds of things that we can constrain with these clock measurements. Um, oh, I should say that the lower end of this, um, uh, this mass is disfavored by astrophysical observations because you're getting all the way to the range where the um, uh, de, Bro de Broglier wavelength is the size of observed galaxies. Uh, so that's an interesting astrophysical constraint that uh, shows up right in the same range uh, that we're 
beginning to constrain here. Um, and I just want to mention, I had nothing to do with this measurement, but to give you another example of the kind of measurements that have been done with ion quarks to constrain fundamental physics. This is a um, beautiful result from a group at PTB that work with um, singly ionized ytterbium. So there they have an S to F transition, an octopole transition, where they take advantage of this highly anisotropic um, nature of the F uh, excited state. And by orienting the uh, magnetic field between two clocks uh, differently and relying on um, the change in orientation um, as the Earth rotates and um, revolves around the sun, they can do a uh, Lorentz symmetry test that was actually uh, much more stringent, in particular in the electron sector, than what had been done previously. So they show this um, really nice stability plot averaging down all the way to a million seconds, and they essentially see no evidence of um, excess uh, oscillation uh, in that signal in the uh, range of frequencies that they looked at. Um, so that's just another example. Um, I think that um, you know the ytterbium system is particularly interesting for this because it has this highly anisotropic uh, excited state. Okay, so um, that gives some flavor of the kind of measurements that uh, we're interested in making. And I want to talk about extending um, the reach of these trapped ion measurements. And um, a really key tool in this is quantum logic spectroscopy, which uh, has been the you know engine behind the aluminum ion clock and is now getting applied to other systems. So just real briefly how that works. Uh, to begin with, um, if you trap two ions in the same trap, um, because they're tightly bound together via Coulomb repulsion, uh, if you cool one of those ions, you will cool sympathetically uh, the other ion. So we immediately have the ability to cool um, any ion from you know, the periodic table down to the ground state of motion uh, within some constraints. Um, and the basic idea for doing state detection is that because we can make these ions interact, we can do a quantum gate between them. And there, there you're transferring information from the spectroscopy system to the qubit system, where you can uh, then do measurements on it. And the thing that you're overcoming here is that very few atomic systems actually have a really nice cycling transition that can be used uh, to do fluorescence measurements. So in the absence of that, uh, you have to do something different from you know, the way that all of the ion species have been detected before. Um, the trick here is just to do a gate between the two ion species and then detect on uh, the qubit that you've stored with, with that ion. This relies on um, cooling to the ground state and a couple of sideband pulses. So I'll describe that process real briefly. Um, the first step is cooling to the motional ground state using the uh, qubit. And you can apply a sideband pulse here on the aluminum ion system, which excites one quantum of motion dependent on the clock state of aluminum. So you're trying to distinguish whether the ion is in the ground state or the excited state. You do a sideband pulse on this auxiliary transition, which inserts a quantum of motion only if the ion is in the singlet S0 state. You transfer that motion to the qubit by doing another sideband pulse on the uh, qubit state. Um, and there you've transferred the initial um, superposition of the clock state on aluminum to the qubit, and then you can detect it using fluorescence measurements. So this is an example from uh, the aluminum system where we get a certain number of photon counts when it's in the ground state, and then a larger number of photon counts when the aluminum ion is in the excited state. Really nice thing about this is that it's uh, um, so-called quantum non-demolition or a projective measurement. Uh, so that means you can repeat the measurement many times, get high fidelity, um, and it can also serve as state preparation. So uh, another necessary ingredient in doing precision spectroscopy on an um, atomic system is that you have to prepare the state. So this is one way that you can do it if you have this uh, projective measurement as I've described. 
So um, since this was first dem demonstrated on aluminum, it's been applied to several different atomic systems. Here's an example uh, showing quantum jumps between several different Zeeman sublevels in the ground state of aluminum. And you know the trick here was that uh, you have to um, transfer the information without scattering a single photon from the aluminum state because that would um, uh, it would destroy the uh, initial state that the uh, aluminum was in. So this was done a bit differently from what I just described, but nevertheless, you can see that it's a projective measurement with quantum jumps between uh, several different levels. It's now been applied to highly charged ions in the group of Peach Schmidt, um, uh, doing measurements on argon 13 plus. Um, and also in our group and Pete's group, uh, there have been um, experiments on molecular ions. So here you have a much more complicated um, atomic structure where you have, um, in addition to the electronic degrees of freedom uh, and spin degrees of freedom, you have rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom. But using those um, features that I described before, um, that the measurement is a projective you know, preparation uh, of the state, uh, uh, very precise measurements have been made now on, on molecular uh, ion systems as well. Um, so with this you know, spreading to uh, so many atomic systems, I guess I wanted to just put up this, um, this vision that I think a lot of people in our community have in some form or another, and Mariana has already mentioned, uh, I think it's really appropriate in this uh, workshop uh, to think about what can we do with this vast network of clocks making measurements at the level of 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19, who knows how far that will go, um, you know, all connected via um, stabilized links. Um, so I just wanna put that up there maybe as food for thought. I think it's a really attractive um, possibility is something we're working towards. I think it has really broad science reach. You can do the kinds of measurements that I've discussed some already. There are opportunities for testing QED on very simple atomic systems. Uh, there might be uh, applications in gravitational waves if you have uh, satellite-based clocks. Um, it's a modular and it's an extensible thing. You're not really putting all your eggs in one basket, you know, you can hook your latest favorite ion or atom up to this uh, network and uh, it will just enable more and more precise measurements. So uh, just something to think about there. Um, so now I wanna move on to uh, some more discussion of quantum logic spectroscopy, but as it pertains to improving measurement stability, and maybe I should just ask, uh, how much time do I have remaining now? Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> At the most, five minutes. At the most, five minutes. Okay, well, this is going to have to be pretty quick. thought I was going a little slow. So there are a limited number of things that you can do to improve measurement stability if you're at the projection noise limit. First thing I want to talk about is increasing the atom number. Um, and this has to do with quantum logic spectroscopy because for aluminum, in order to increase the atom number, we're gonna have to come up with new techniques uh, to make measurements like what I described, but on larger strings of ions. And it's not gonna be just applying the exact same um, pulse sequence to a longer string of ions. We're gonna have to um, adopt new um, new gate schemes and probably, you know, borrowing from the work that's been done um, in quantum computing uh, in ion traps. So the, the idea is to go from here to here, and then in the future, you can imagine doing something that's a much larger scale. Um, the thing that we've implemented recently is uh, Schrodinger CAT interferometer, um, which is a really sensitive detection of ion motional displacement. And I'll just describe basically how this works. So imagine a qubit, this is a phase space picture of the motion. You start this interferometer by doing a pi halves pulse uh, on the qubit state. Um, if you 
then apply a state dependent displacement you've separated in phase space, those two qubit states uh, into different motional wave packets. Um, and you use that to uh, sense some unknown displacement. So now the state, uh, you've added this unknown displacement beta. Um, if you then recombine the motional wave packets, uh, you can interfere them by doing another pi halves pulse on the qubit and detecting, and your probability of detecting the uh, ion in the ground state has something to do with this geometric phase that you've built up uh, during this interferometer. So this is just another way of getting, um, you know, uh, a, a motion sensitive um, qubit measurement in, in a trapped ion. Um, so this has been applied to a number of different things over the years. It was first um, demonstrated in uh, our group, just uh, showing this so-called schrodinger cat superposition state of the atom and using it to study motional decoherence. It's the same idea has been used for detecting single atom, sorry, single photon recoils. And it's been applied to very sensitive force detection in um, ion crystals of up to hundreds of uh, ions in a penning trap. And this is really the idea that inspired this work that we've done now trying to scale up quantum logic spectroscopy. This is a case where um, the idea is clearly scalable. Um, so what we do is that exact procedure where we put as the unknown displacement some state dependent force on the aluminum ion. So here I'm showing the uh, level structure again of the qubit and then the aluminum ion it has single at a zero and a triple p1 uh, state and what we've been able to do by inserting this um, state dependent displacement on the aluminum ion been able to see uh, nice resonances um, with a single magnesium and a single aluminum and we've scaled that up to seeing resonance and resonances in up to three aluminum ions uh, and in this case, it wasn't even a linear um, array of ions. Here, the um, ions had started go, to go into a zigzag configuration. Uh, so this is nice. It seems like it's a pretty robust technique. Um, we've looked at the detection efficiency, and now we're using this interaction to detect the clock state of aluminum. Um, one interesting thing that we found here is that it's actually more efficient to do this detection at the Doppler limit than using uh, ions cooled to the ground state. And that's just because the extra ground state cooling uh, takes some time. Uh, so we found that it's more efficient uh, at the Doppler limit. And as you put more detection ions in there, so scaling up the number of detection ions uh, or qubits, uh, we get better uh, signal to noise ratio, which is represented in this uh, detection efficiency. Um, we've looked a little bit about how this scales in terms of reaching the projection noise limits, and the overall message is just that it looks pretty good, even with a single detection sequence, although you will have projection noise from both the spectroscopy ions and the logic ions in a single detection sequence, you can get very close to the projection noise limit, and if you repeat it like we do in a single uh, experiment, you can really saturate this uh, um, this standard quantum limit. Um, and I think that I'm really running out of time here, so I want to go quickly over this. We've done some work as well um, to uh, improve the measurement stability by not implementing a more stable laser to improve this first factor, which is the quality factor of the resonance we're probing but using a new technique to mitigate laser noise entirely. Um, and the idea there is just that if you have correlated laser noise on the two systems, so you're probing them with the same laser, um, if you do your measurement right, you can still get uh, uh, frequency dependent signal. It's um, dependent on the frequency difference between your two clock ions and different um, traps here. Uh, because uh, in this superposition, there is some component that's a decoherence-free subspace. So any common mode noise just drops out. 
And there we were actually able to see the lifetime limit uh, instability uh, for the two aluminum clocks in the low sort of 10 to the minus 16 level. That's about a factor of 10 improvement over what I showed earlier in the um, ratio measurements that we did. That's now actually been applied to measurements between an aluminum ion clock and a ytterbium okay. lattice clock using a slightly soon. different. As soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Yeah, and with that, um, we th this can be for discussion. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank my group uh, for all the work and the agencies that fund us. So thank you. Great. Thank you for the very nice talk. So we have some time for, for discussions. Um, please uh, raise your hand or, or speak up and mute yourself. Maybe then I can start asking. So in John's experiment, when we were trying to do the, the analog of your cat state, we were really sensitive to center of mass fluctuations. Uh, and this was kind of the, the most important limitation for us. Uh, in your setup, is this also something that matters or, or, or it's less important? Yeah, it does matter. Um, and, you know, one difference um, between at least the early work that uh, John was doing uh, is that we are right on resonance. Yes, we are. Uh, too. Yeah, yeah, which is which um, means that those uh, fluctuations in the center of mass frequency show up more strongly. Um, so what we actually did to uh, mitigate that was to lock in in interleaved experiments on the ion. We would lock in that frequency by adjusting the trap voltages in real time. Um, and so that over the course of, you know, hours of measurement, that would keep the center of mass uh, frequency right where we had calibrated. I see. I see. Nice. Great. Thanks. So I think uh, I see another. Anupan, please go ahead. First of all, David, very nice talk. So I just wanted to ask you, so you, uh, it's very nice that you were using this rare earth material like ethereum. And so what is the, I mean, uh, um, coherence time scale? Can you get it for these systems now? Um, so I'll just say the ytterbium, and I'm not sure if you're talking about the ytterbium ion or ytterbium lattice. Uh, for the, which one you were using? Perhaps you were using ion, I guess. Okay, so um, the measurements that we made, yeah, there was a ytterbium lattice clock involved in those. Okay. And that's, that, that's in the group of Andrew Ludlow at NIST, um, the, the ultimate coherence time limit in all of these clocks is given by the excited state lifetime. And with the ytterbium lattice clock, that's on the order of 20 seconds. I don't know the exact number. It's real similar to what it is with aluminum, uh, which is uh, around 20 seconds. Uh, so if you wanna do better than that, um, you're gonna have to choose another atom. Uh, and there, there are certainly possibilities out there. For example, the strontium, uh, transition has a longer lifetime, the excited state has a longer lifetime, um, more than 100 seconds. And the ytterbium ion, which I also mentioned, has essentially an infinite lifetime. Um, I don't know exactly the number, but it's it's measured in days or months or maybe even years. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Lance, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. It was fascinating. Um, speaking of other uh, systems, Mariana mentioned the thorium uh, metastable nuclear transition. Could you just say a word about the different technology that's needed to do clocks like that versus the ones that you do? Yeah, so we actually do in our group have um, just, just starting up um, an effort at a thorium ion clock. Um, so the first thing is that, um, well, for various reasons, um, thorium three plus is uh, an attractive a candidate for using as the nuclear clock uh, because it um, has a nice structure for for laser cooling, basically. I mean, the, the nucleus itself doesn't care so much about exactly which ionized species you use, uh, but you have to get a hold of it somehow. And so um, the thorium three plus is a you know single electron 
atom. It's it's a simpler system. Uh, so there's the challenge in generating thorium three plus and loading it into the ion trap. There's a challenge in um, holding on to it long enough because it'll undergo charge exchange collisions with background gas more readily than the singly ionized atoms. So it's going to be, in our case, a cryogenic system. Um, and then, you know, there's probably the biggest challenge in uh, all of this is generating highly stable laser light at 150 nanometers. Uh, which is something we're going to uh, rely on June's group and their expertise in making, um, you know, high harmonic combs uh, that can reach that wavelength. So June might have uh, more to say about that. But there are really a, a number of challenges that, you know, they need expertise of uh, not just our group, but other groups uh, in the area. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, so we have three more minutes. Um, Diego, if you want, uh, if you have a short questions, let's go for it. Otherwise, if, it's, if you think it's long, we can postpone it to the to the discussion. Uh, let me well, know. Well, it's, it's precisely I, I have to miss the discussion because I have uh, other obligations. So I oh, want okay. to just make a suggestion. Uh, what? Uh, that there are other ways to use atomic clocks or these precise systems to detect dark matter. Uh, for instance, we have a paper with uh, Peter Wolf, who is also a leader in Europe on this. And the idea is that by the scattering of dark matter with your states, you may you may induce on them a new phase that may be also, you know, a characteristic of, of the interactions that are happening in your clock. So, for instance, the same that you have um, when you have a clock, you try to get rid of all the uh, possible backgrounds that are hitting your state, uh, some of them, I mean, once you get rid of the standard model backgrounds, you may still have a dark matter background, which is generating some, some noise because of a scattering with the clock. Not because it is coherently associating with it, but really because it's kicking your, your, your atoms all the time. As I said, unfortunately, I have to miss the discussion. <laughs> so uh, um, maybe tomorrow I can join for this. Yes, we, we can con uh, we can in principle uh -huh. continue the tomorrow. I mean, there is going to be also room. But that's like yeah. a three-day workshop. Um, great. So yeah, that, that that sounds interesting. If if I can just ask quickly, um, that model of dark matter, it sounds like it's a heavier mass. It's heavier uh, mass. It's like classical. It's like classical particles hitting hitting your 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 atoms. So I mean, so many times that eventually they they may uh, have them. I mean, they have, may have an effect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can okay. Give, talk about this. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for the comment. Great. So let me uh, say that we thank Dave for the fantastic talk, and then we.